Good evening from London. My name is Vikas, and uh, I've been using this live stream to uh, to bring to the teacher audience and the members of the T4 community uh, friends of mine who are prolific in what they do, uh, so that we get a better understanding of, of of various aspects of the education sector, if not society as a whole. Um, there's a lot of interesting people and a lot of interesting opinions, and we're at this particular juncture in time where there's so much change uh, that is taking place that it's always very useful to speak to the other people and get perspectives. So today I'm glad that with me I have my friends, uh, Juan Romero, who is right now in Uruguay, and uh, Runit Avni, who is in the US. Um, welcome, guys. Uh, welcome to this, uh, to this uh, live stream. Thank Thanks you. for having us with us. Great. And, and, and so, you know, unlike the other subjects that I often pick on, which are to do with schooling and particularly related to the K-12 sector, as it's referred to, I want to focus today on higher education in, in specific and its connection to the world of work, uh, because I know that that is uh, the two are kind of linked in my head, at least. And so I want to discuss both of these things with you. But before before we talk about the future of higher ed, I, I was hoping I'd come to you, Juan, regarding well, what has been the impact uh, of the pandemic on higher education? And then we can get into some of your work and some of your thoughts on what the future may be. So please, over to you to give us an understanding. Well, I think uh, 2020, the, the COVID year, um, has had an enormous impact in terms of accelerating uh, the digital growth, the online growth, the virtual growth, or the pain that that could cause to students or, or faculty organizations that weren't ready. And you're, you're basically seeing three things happening at the same time. On the one hand, for those, those universities, um, and this isn't necessarily the whole university, it could be a program or a department um, that was ready and set up for online growth, it's been extraordinary what they've experienced, right? You have institutions that grew by 50%, 100%. You've seen what the, uh, what's what been happening in the MOOCs, uh, Coursera and, and, and their peers. It, it's been really extraordinary. Um, and then at the same time, you there were many universities I would say that weren't ready, right? And at, you know, even though there, there have been some issues around uh, enrollment decline, or let's call it disorganized uh, preparedness, or hybrid learning, or even online learning, I've actually uh, been fairly optimistic uh, as to what I've seen in all around the world. You know, in Latin America, in the U.S., Europe, Asia, Africa, everywhere is there was no choice but to jump into the water, right? And I think what the vast majority of the universities found is, you know, it might be difficult. There might be elements that they struggled with, but they, they've embraced it. You know, they, they, they put together the faculty training. They've done their best with getting the, the course materials ready, getting the, their, their faculty ready, and they've done it, right? And, and it shows that, you know, if one is brave, right, uh, if you have the right help, from different organizations, technology providers, if you really support the faculty, that in some fashion, you can engage a student, a program virtually, right? So uh, again, you've seen a big diversity of experiences, uh, traumatic, untraumatic, high growth, di different aspects, but you've really seen that every, no one had a choice. They, they had to experience it in some fashion. So I think that's been very health, healthy for the university sector. I mean, so one, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about whenever I speak to or listen to management consultants in particular, um, you know, what you hear about is how trends have been accelerated uh, mm -hmm. during this time. So changes were afoot is what we hear. Um, and maybe can you either say whether you agree with that or disagree with that and on, on either answer that you give, give us a little bit more color in terms of what your thoughts are. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that every university um, approached it in the same way. And sometimes the, the change was in 
let's go faster. So a uh, university was experimenting um, with one master's program or just our continuing education programs. And they said, okay, we have five ready. Um, I have to shut down the university. Students can't come to camp campus. Well, why don't I go faster? Why don't I bring my all of my graduate degrees or all of my continuing education or all of my undergraduate degrees um, uh, online? And, and you've seen this at all, let's call it areas of study, price points and countries. Um, and, and not just the universities, right? But the regulators in many countries, you found that the regulator wasn't ready for COVID. And all of a sudden where let's say reforms were lagging, you know, there was a moratorium. They really gave a lot of autonomy to, to the higher ed sector. And then all of a sudden the, the regulator also partnered uh, with the universities to, to meet the students online, the only place they could meet them, right? And, and, and this, uh, you know, I'm talking mostly about, let's call it academic or the courses, but if you look at all the other elements of what's involved in teaching and learning or the business aspects or the technology aspects, you saw that acceleration there. So more content development, more faculty training, um, doing things that weren't academic with the students, you know, the fun stuff, mental health, um, you know, other elements like I did not see a sector of the student experience or the university experience that didn't accelerate in its engagement of, of virtual learning or blended learning. But do you think, and maybe this is a great question to go to Ronit about actually, so please pay attention. Uh, but one, I'm going to come to you first on this, is that you say that trends have been accelerated. But if I look at it from a learner or student perspective, um, you know, sure, I understand the point you make regarding online learning and making that pivot. But essentially, from a student perspective, they're still in massive debt, right? And they're still unable to connect to the to the workplace and and that ecosystem that's required. So in that sense, from a learner or a student or a customer perspective, what has really changed? Okay. No, I think in the short term, with the exception of universities, let's say, being more uh, flexible, giving discounts, uh, giving students more time, you haven't seen an, an acceleration of the pricing challenges or the cost challenges, right? The, the criticisms that existed, and this is uh, the US is the market where this problem is the largest, there haven't been any changes, right? I, I'm part of a university group where we have the largest online university in Mexico and an OPM that helps universities go online. And um, since our origin, we've always believed in open, affordable edu education. Our average undergraduate degree costs $100 a month and our students don't have student financing. And I think that revolution, so open and affordable higher ed education for all, that change has not taken place. And even though there's pressure from the innovators, from the low cost providers, um, it's just beginning. I don't believe there's been significant change in the last 12 months. So you, you, so if I go back to my original question about what trends have been accelerated, this is one thing or two things that really haven't changed. And actually they've taken a, you know, the other end of the acceleration, the deceleration, in terms of the discussion about not receiving the quality of education that they uh, they paid for, signed up for, but still being charged the same level of fees to attend these places. So you'd agree with that? And no, and I have it. And the students have voted with their feet. If you look at the student for behavior and performance and enrollment behavior in most countries, the programs which have shown the most amount of growth are the more affordable ones and the online ones. And this could be a discounted master's that would cost $50,000 at a premium university and their online program costs 35,000, or it could be at the, let's call it the, the, the value segment, you know, going towards um, the programs which are truly affordable for some, you know, an, an adult learner who's working or for an emerging middle-class family, right? So you have seen it, but it, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's not a trend where the sector has said we're too expensive. We need to figure out how to offer university education more affordably 
and we're changing now. You hear a lot of statements, you see trends, and you see different uh, behavior in terms of growth and where students are going, but it hasn't been a dramatic change, right? And it's necessary, it's absolutely necessary. And so, Rune, did I come to you regarding this disconnect that exists? And I know that your work at lo Localized is very much related to the world of work uh, and helping students actually navigate that in their university years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, do you want to speak a little bit about your work and then, and then try to help us figure out an answer to this question? Sure. So from my perspective, there's been a night and day shift. Our company, Localized, connects university students and recent graduates with industry experts to guide them and employers to hire them virtually. And we began in emerging markets, so we started in the Middle East and North Africa. And now we have students in over 60 countries, universities in the US, India, China, uh, and the MENA region. And before COVID, we had to try to make the case that the future of career services and employer services was global and online. And that was a tough sell. People were very resistant. And in fact, um, there was reason to be resistant because for example, in a place like the Middle East and North Afri Africa, most of the recruiting was happening at on-campus career fairs. It was very analog, very in-person. It was a select number of universities where the companies would go and recruit. And so there was an entrenched system that worked for the students, it worked for the universities. It didn't necessarily work for the employers in terms of getting the kinds of talent pools that they were ultimately looking for, um, but it, it was entrenched. And when coronavirus happened um, and hit, obviously, uh, you know, I wish it hadn't and it was a terrible thing, but I do believe that there has been an acceleration of certain trends that are not going to go backwards. So for example, um, we at Localized held two MENA-wide virtual career fairs, so Middle East and North Africa-wide virtual career fairs. The first one that we held, it turns out, was the first ever in the, across the region. And we surveyed employers um, that came to participate. And these were very large employers, Fortune 500 companies, that when they responded to our survey, almost 70% of them had never recruited virtually before at that um, fresh graduate level. So of course they do using tools like LinkedIn when it comes to more seasoned employees, um, but not at the early stage hires. And 80% of them, we surveyed them after the fact, plan to continue to do so moving forward. So I think there's a sea change happening when it comes to how employers are thinking about finding and hiring fresh talent. It's also um, dramatically changing the geographies that they're interested in. And for students, one of the things that we found over the course of the year was a very big change from being uh, timid or hesitant about accepting a first job remotely to becoming remote natives. We talk about digital natives, but this generation, these are remote natives. Uh, we've even seen it on our team as we've been making fresh hires. People who've said to us, you know, a year ago, I would have never taken a remote job, but now I feel very comfortable and it turns out I enjoy working or studying or functioning remotely. So we're seeing a very big uh, shift on the employer relations side of things. The other area that I think has changed quite a bit is the decoupling of career services from the university institution itself. That's already been happening with OPMs and other, other entities that were helping universities. From our perspective, um, I'm a big believer in utilizing a medium for its strengths. So if you're just trying to replicate an in-person experience online, it's going to fail. But if you take the advantages of platforms and apply them and really embrace them. So in this era of COVID, we're having this conversation, Juan and Vikas and me, we're in three continents, we're in different time zones. We wouldn't necessarily come together to have this conversation in normal times. We'd be going to our respective conferences and, and, and our day to, day to day. But because the world is so much smaller, we can access global expertise on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's something that Localize is very focused on. Um, when, when schools and students join the platform, they're hearing from experts like yourselves every single day talking about career trends, providing them with just-in-time and up-to-the-minute information about how they can be ready, not just for the work, workforce, but for world-class level um, standards. And that's something that I think a lot of schools are starting to embrace. How can they take advantage of this leveling of geographies and time zones? And so, Ronit, thank you for that. And that was pretty fabulous what you just said. And it's actually one of the bugbears I do have is regards to career services. 
you know, I have a daughter who's 17 who's going through this process now of thinking about what university and actually thinking about what she wants to study at university so then she can enter the world of work and be productive. Now, the thing is, is that when, when I go to a career fair or career service at a school, you know, the teacher is still none the wiser actually as to how they should answer the question regarding uh, when little, uh, you know, Johnny puts their hand up and says, Miss, Miss, you know, uh, what should I do after I leave school? Um, and so that hasn't changed from my time at school. Uh, mm -hmm. And so in your view, how, what is it that we can do to help teachers answer that question? That's a great question. So first of all, I would say that we should not place the burden on teachers to be the experts of every single sector that is evolving exponentially right now. It's impossible. So fintech, medtech, edtech, AI, robotics, renewable, sustainable construction, you name it. There's so much that's changing, so many roles and jobs and titles. It's not physically possible for teachers to be informed about all that's taking place. Instead, what I would propose, and that's something that we've built out at Localize, but there are many manifestations of this out there, is to make sure that students are exposed to as wide a network as possible. So level the, the playing field on social capital, meaning bring in what I would call the jargon that I, I use is this idea of approximate role model. Somebody that your daughter or little Johnny can look at and they can say, wow, if that person can pursue a career in AI, maybe I can too. And so it's got to be somebody that's credible to that student to believe that it's within the realm of possibility that that's a career path that's available to them. Now, if your question is, well, how do they do that, right? Um, I think we can decouple it. So if you're in an elite network, you can tap into that very easily, right? So, so Vikas, you run in many circles. Your daughter has access to incredibly inspiring people from all over the world. So she she's getting it through osmosis. She's getting it at home and at the dinner table and when you're out uh, together. But for a lot of students, that's not feasible. And so that's where I think supplementing it, either getting online or through resources, that's what at Localize we're curating these conversations every day partnering with groups like Junior Achievement and others. But it, the more that you can bring in those role models, and to be clear, it doesn't take more than 20 minutes or half an hour or an hour of exposure, because all it takes is for somebody to understand that there is a field called sports tech. And so if you're passionate about sports, to even know that within sports tech, there are you know, a hundred different ways that you could enter the sector and do something interesting and, and learning about that. So I'm a big believer in getting those role models in front of students to answer their questions. And that's scalable. You can do that in a one to many, uh, one to thousands, one to tens of thousands kind of a way. And Bruni, I mean, you are, um, we've known each other for some time and you're actually very gracious to, uh, to serve as a judge for the Global Teacher Prize. And I wanna take you back to a story from those days where uh, a winner uh, from the UK, Andrea Zafiriku, for example, won her prize uh, that year purely because one of the magical things that she did was bring a, a, a working artist into her classroom so that the kids in her classroom could get inspired and have an alternate adult to engage with on a subject. And so she went on and donated the entire million dollars to set up a NGO called Artists in Residence, which I'm a trustee of, with wow. the exact aim of actually taking artists into I think it's 50, 50 schools around this country and that program is growing. So I fully agree with you. Yeah. But the, the issue that we have and the assumption that you, may, you make, I think, and one I wanna bring you in on here is that it's easy to do. So one of the other stories that she told me was, you know, the, she, her school is on a high street, which is bustling normally, like, you know, it has shops, has footfall, has a, a religious institution, um, and so there's plenty of people around this community, but she found it incredibly difficult to attract those people into a school where the oh, the biggest celebrity that would that would turn up is the local branch manager of her bank. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and you just think, well, this is the situation that we're in. And so I want to understand from you, Juan, in terms of how do you fix this disconnect um, that exists? And I understand what, what Ronit is saying about role modeling and career services and thinking about platform. But what is your take on this, given that you work in that sector? Yeah, no, so I would say, you know, two or three things. First Actually, of all, one, 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 I want to stop you for a second because I, this is quite a special moment. 
we have a former prime minister of Greece actually commenting on LinkedIn, commenting on what you've just said. And he says, George Papandreou says, yes, teachers should not carry the burden of explaining all the possibilities for future work of their students. Teachers, however, can orchestrate exposure of students to the variety of possibilities, skills or professions. This, however, means that schools are open to link with the world around them, partner with neighborhood services, industry, local government, the world of art and design. It is a change of mindset, he says. Ronit, I'm going to come to you first. Do you have a response for George? First of all, it's so nice to see you here. Um, so thank you for, for participating. I absolutely agree with that. So I think um, it's essential to have the mindset and the connectivity. Those are the two things. Connectivity, creativity, and mindset are the beginning of making that transformation. The how is doable. We can get into the weeds on that later. I absolutely agree with that, that schools should be seen as a window into all kinds of alternative pathways and opportunities. And then we're giving students the skills to be curious and to seize upon and to learn about and learn how to learn uh, about those options so that they can then make, make informed choices. Thank you so much. Uh, Juan, come back to you on this, please. No, I think uh, two things are very important. Uh, one is uh, educational institution leadership and partnering, right? And this applies to K-12 schools and it applies to universities. Um, if you look at the evolution that K-12 schools have experienced as there has been a greater effort on forming the leaders, not just the teachers, but also the leaders. And then when those leaders have the tools, have the mindset and have the support that the, the career decision, the how do you make a career decision? Um, how do you start doing that? Not just, you want I wanna go to college or I wanna get into a trade program or become an apprentice. So you make that part of the, the leadership choice and then you give the school the, the counseling department and the teachers, the support, whether it's partnering with Localize, which is more focused in the university sector, but whatever those organizations are locally or nationally or, or virtually for the schools. And then at the university level, the, the, the universities do have to make it a priority. There are many universities that are more comfortable, let's call it, with the academic role. And, and that's very important, giving the students the foundation of the learning of the degrees um, and how that's a basis for what comes next. But to make sure that they also have those links um, into the marketplace, right? And a university shouldn't think that they have to come up with all those capabilities themselves. It is not possible. You need to find organizations that, that can support. Now on the faculty side, I think universities that have a balance between research-oriented faculty and adjunct faculty, or let's call it practitioners, I think that's very valuable because when you have um, a, a professor leading a class that brings into what they're doing during the day or what they're going to do tomorrow, let's call it in their professional field, not just what they're doing when they're teaching in a virtual classroom or in a presential classroom, I think that's very healthy. So I think mixing up the, the faculty mix and the decision so it happens naturally, right? And, and, and you don't have to necessarily set up a special session or a mentoring program, but it just becomes the part of the DNA of that university or part of the DNA and in the interaction that you know a, a part-time professor gives to a student. So I think that's what you have to think about. Leadership, is it a priority? Um, and partnering with organizations that, that can help you achieve that for your students. You, you provide an excellent segue. I've been asking all my guests over the last few weeks uh, in terms of, you know, there's a teacher audience that obviously interacts with us and engages with us um, that is wider than what you're seeing in the comments. Um, and one of the things that continuously comes up is this question about what is leadership? And given both of you and your background, so Juan and I have known each other for quite some time. He's a steadfast education uh, professional uh, in commercial education in specific. Uh, Ronit has a much more of a mixed background, actually. You used to be a filmmaker, a human, human rights activist, and now you've set up Localized. Um, you know, what are the, the three leadership lessons that you'd like for teachers to know about that, that stem from your experience and your lives that you 
you, you have experience of actually providing uh, some guidance to them on. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, you, Ronit, if that's okay. Uh, if you don't have three, mention one. It doesn't matter in that sense, but we want some insight from you as to what is leadership and how do you develop it? So I would say number one is agency, um, cultivating a sense of agency in students. That's essential. It's essential for being good citizens. It's essential for being of the world or of particular uh, nation states. Um, but that agency, that can start very early, age three, age four, where people feel that they have a role to play in what happens to themselves, to their environment, to their community. So that would be number one. The second is creativity. And in all of the conversations about how to future-proof students for the AI revolution and, and for everything that is coming to displace uh, a lot of the, the jobs that we've historically uh, filled as a society, creativity is going to be essential. And the third one is resilience. And um, that resilience, that adaptability, um, that comes with being able to take on challenges. And, and it starts early. I, I would say for me professionally, uh, so much of what I applied when I launched my media organization before, when I launched Localize, those were all skills that I had honed as a teenager, um, taking on projects and doing things where I had quite a bit of responsibility. And that's really thanks to the adults and the community around me. So I would say it starts, you know, by preschool, you can already be cultivating um, these three attributes. Fantastic, and one. Well, um, I think Ronas were very good, and if I could sort of add to that a little bit, uh, and this is an example that's I would say it's overused, but I've found it's been the most important element of my success is, and that's passion. Right? You know, sometimes you know what motivates you and what drives you. And sometimes you take a few years, a few decades to get to it. But when when you see it and you feel it and you're surrounded by it, then everything changes, right? Then th that area that you're studying, that industry that you're working in, it isn't work anymore, right? It's, uh, you love to be, or in my case, it's, it's education. Um, and, and I think finding that could be sports, could be music, could be business, uh, could be tech, whatever it is, find it. And then it almost doesn't matter um, how you unfold as, as, a, as a leader, as a professional in that space. Um, I think the second thing is you, there are so many people that can help you along the way. And oftentimes uh, one is too proud or too insular or to something to not ask for help along the way. And every time I've made a mistake in my career, it's because I haven't asked for help. And every time I've asked for advice or I've asked for help from a boss, from a colleague, from someone on my team, parent, friend, whatever it is, it, it's sort of uh, given me wisdom and just helped me get on with it better or be more successful. So uh, leave that pride at the door and ask for help uh, along the way. And then the final thing is balance, right? Um, so many hard charging leaders forget about uh, balance. And I think that's the easiest one to forget. And if you want to win the marathon, then you, knew, you do need a degree of balance, right? Uh, and whether that's taking care of yourself or giving yourself some time for leisure, for your family. Um, don't forget that. I think balance is important. You're right. One of the things that has come through as a, as a fantastic silver lining to actually the pandemic in, in education is this focus on well-being. Um, you know, and we've known for so long that it's just so important, but it just wasn't prioritized, whether by, by structures uh, or by individuals, but now we all are in heavily engaged in this discussion, which I think is a is a, is a great, uh, like I said, silver lining that has emerged from the pandemic. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ronit and and Juan, for accepting my invitation to join us. Um, you know, through this medium, I was looking uh, for uh, to help uh, teachers work out what this you know this future of higher education and its connection to to the world of work and Ronit, you provided some fantastic perspectives with regards to career services and how to actually approach uh, careers advice. And one, you were very uh, eloquent as you always are uh, on, on making a pitch for your business on how we get more universities to go online. 
uh, you know, and a future conversation I want to have with you one is, is around, you know, what tips would you give teachers uh, as to how they go online? Um, and what is it that you've learned from your experiences? But that's a separate conversation that we will come to in the future. Uh, okay. And I look forward to having that with you. So thank you both for, for your time. And I look forward to a forward opportunity. Uh, take care. And uh, I wish you all well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vikas.